you for actually joining us on the webinar. Okay, sorry about that. So JamLab is actually short for journalism and media. And what we aim to do is to promote innovation and we Hi, Philip. Hi. So sorry about that, guys. I'm trying to get Philip up. Hi, Philip. Okay. Okay. Um, while I try to get, or while uh, Philip tries to connect, um, I think we should continue with the program. So for, for today's program, we have invited two previous companies who are part of the accelerator program to actually take us through what they have been up to and how their entrepreneurial journey has been so far. So first on our virtual stage, we have Kathy Mohobi, founder of Code This Woman, an organization building a database of credible women experts in traditionally male dominated fields to appear on panels and voices that newsroom can easily access. The organization is collating new narratives with the aim of broadening the news agenda. Kathy, please tell us more about the work that your organization does. Awesome. Thank you very much for introducing me. And it's so great to be here today. Um, so uh, I see Philip's back. I'm not sure if Philip wants to speak or if you want me to carry on. No, Philip's gone again. Okay, <laughs> I'll take that as my cue. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, so thank you very much. Um, when I was preparing um, to speak today, I was I remembered something that. Um, um, uh, G Sport for Girls said at a presentation of theirs recently, they said it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. Um, and I just loved that. It was something that I held onto very strongly. Um, quote, this woman is just coming up to its fourth birthday and we are far from being an overnight success. We are hanging in um, just by, I think, by our fingernails um, onto being alive. And every year that we're still alive, we is an absolute celebration for us. Um, so um, we are a passion project. Um, we're a project that um, has stayed alive for four years because it's something that we believe very, very strongly in. Um, and if I had to put our success, our ability to have stayed alive for so long down to one thing, it would be that. The fact that we just are um, a group of people who really believe in the why behind our business. Um, when, when, we started, when we started at Jam Lab, um, I remember doing that Lean Canvas exercise and um, I remember doing starting off by looking at the why and um, I think everything became so simple from there because we had such a strong why. Um, we were intersectional feminists who really believed that it was important to close the gender gap 
um, in the news that as it was being made um, in South Africa at that moment, which was at the build up to the 2019 elections. So um, the fact that we had stumbled across um, a way of doing this, which was um, something we hadn't come up with, it was something that we'd seen in the UK and in, in America, and that we thought was applicable to South Africa, um, made it really easy for us. Um, so we, we had the why and we had a solution. And then Jam Lab taught us to go and do the research and find the data that would be able to convince people um, to come behind what we were doing, to, to get behind us and to get behind what we were doing. Um, so I think one of the big things that gave us the resilience was firstly believing what we were doing and then having the data in order to do it. Um, and um, so, so yes, yeah, so we had a very clear problem statement and we had um, a very clear solution and we were able to get people behind us. Um, the other thing that that Lean Canvas program taught us was stick on vaporware, um, stick on the simplest um, execution of your ideas, don't overinvest in anything. And only last year did uh, this woman win a, a GNI Google News Initiative grant in order to be able to actually build this database that for four years we've been telling everyone we had. Um, in fact, we didn't have a proper database. We had something that had been cobbled together in the spare time by another Jam Lab um, uh, alumnus, which is Media Hack. Um, they had done it for us totally pro bono, um, which meant that every time it broke, we had to wait until they had time on a weekend to fix it again pro bono. And because they had cobbled it together in their own way, it was their own funny way of coding um, that wasn't something anyone else could get onto and fix for us. So it was very, very uh, complicated for us, but it meant that um, we spent almost no money. Um, I think quote must be the most frugal program any that has ever been through a jam lab. Um, um, uh, uh, program. I would defy anyone to show us their balance sheet and prove that they are more frugal than we are. Um, so if you want to know our secret of success, it's just don't spend money. Um, <laughs> we, we really just don't spend money. Um, it's the best way to, to keep money in the bank and to stay alive. Um, so yeah, so so that no spend system is, um, people will say, how do you do it? Um, I don't know, you just don't spend money. We, we've never had offices, we've never done branding, we've, um, we haven't spent money until we got this Google grant on, um, on tech, yeah. Um, and I think it's also having a passion project, something you believe in. Um, uh, we've had a very, very small, incredibly committed team who have just put the hours in um, and really believed in what we've done. Um, so yeah, the passion, the people, um, and then also that that pull factor. You know, we've done what journalists have asked us to do, and and no more than that at any given time. Um, and that's how we've managed to keep love. I don't know how long I've been talking for, um, but I feel I should wrap it up at that stage. Um, I think I've said everything I wanted to say at the stage and maybe I can answer questions later. Thank you very much, Kathy, um, for that. Um, I just have a few questions um, oh. before I open um, the questions to the floor. Just wanted to know with your experience um, within outside of Jam Lab, what are some of your aha moments when building an enterprise? So both within and outside of Jam Lab, yes. did you say? Yes. Um, I, think, I think the biggest one was realizing the power of both marketing and metrics. Um, so that unless we went out onto social media, um, 
wrote up ads, um, but really marketed ourselves, we would be nothing in the current world. So one thinks it's like often shoemakers, you know that saying, um, shoemakers' children don't have shoes or, or are barefoot because the shoemaker can't build his own children's shoes. So often you think, well, we're a media project, we don't need to market ourselves. Oh my gosh, do we need to market ourselves as, as media products? And I think I learned that from Jam Lab, that you just have to push yourself on, uh, on social media and media, but also collect metrics. So to always have the data to back up what you're saying so people can get behind you um, and believe in you and also talk about you. Um, so there's nothing, nothing big, bigger than finding out that there was a conference that you weren't at where someone quoted some of your data, some of your metrics, because you had pushed those metrics well enough either on social media or through other newsletters. So I'd say that was probably the biggest, one of the biggest aha moments, marketing and metrics. And congratulations on um, the Google grant. I know it's very competitive. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Um, what does the future of um, digital media look like for Africa? Wow. You know, if you'd asked me that question, before chat GPT, I may have been able to answer you um, vaguely coherently, um, but haven't, hasn't the whole, whole world just changed? Um, unfortunately, whenever we try and answer that question, the whole issue of the digital divide still is such a big one that we have to take into consideration. Um, so it seems like the more the opportunities um, become um, prevalent, so the greater the digital divide seems to be something that we have to keep, um, keep be aware of. Um, so I guess my answer is, I don't know, but I am fascinated. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for the honesty, especially with um, Church GPT. Mm. Um, also, one, um, what, um, what is your biggest milestone uh, thus far? And where does Quote This Woman draw um, its inspiration from? Okay, that's a lovely question. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so I guess our three, mm, can, I, can I have many, can I have a, a, a textured, multi-textured milestone? Yes, you can. Right. So definitely staying alive to our fourth birthday. Every birthday is a milestone that we are hugely proud of because we know how hard it is to just stay alive um, as, a, as, a, as a media entrepreneur. Um, so yeah, our birthday is basically in January each year. So we're still amped that we're, we're still alive, um, small as we are. Um, then um, getting to 750 women plus experts on our database, I mean, that just seems amazing for us. Um, and knowing that they're not only in South Africa, Africa they're actually extending up to Africa. That is a really, really huge thing. And then finally getting the Google grant. You know, that is finally getting recognition in the grant um, funding space that, that gives us credibility to feel that we, we are a, a serious player um, and it gives us credibility in applying, in applying for future grants. Um, did I answer you the, your question fully? Was there any part I didn't answer? No, you answered it fully. Um, okay. No, you didn't answer it fully. Uh, the, the second part of it was, where do you draw your inspiration from? I draw my inspiration from every single expert who joins our database. When I see those applications and I vet them, I 
you know, a part of me falls in love with every single expert because they are just amazing. Um, my husband comes and says to me, come on, you can't be falling in love with women. Um, and I say, but you don't realize how absolutely amazing these women are on our database. Um, they are so inspirational, every single one of them. And that is what just gives me the, the passion to keep on going um, with the work that we're doing. They are just, there is amazing resource for journalists to draw on. Um, in finding a more nuanced base um, of experts to quote in their stories. Thank you for that, Kathy. And uh, back to your um, comment on funding. I know that funding can be um, very, very big, uh, but challenging. Um, please, can you share tips with fellow entrepreneurs on where to look and what to look out for? Um, yeah, so, um, that's, you know, I think that I'm going to start by putting in the chat our back of body campaign that we're running right now, if anybody feels like supporting both this woman. Um, so we do everything from crowdfunding to, um, to asking corporate sponsors to applying for grants, um, we, um, as a nonprofit, we um, are in a little bit of a different space um, for in terms of asking for funding. There are grants that are applicable to us um, that aren't always applicable elsewhere. Um, so we will try absolutely anything in order to ask for funding. We network like absolute crazy and we just never stop asking. You know, I went to a uh, a, a talk on fundraising that said you never get the funds you don't ask for um, and that was absolutely profound for me sometimes you think I just can't put myself out there and I just can't do my two-minute elevator speech at a coffee shop um, when I overhear somebody talking who sounds important but if you don't try you just don't know so you just have to network like crazy. You have to know your two-minute elevator speech and you have to know your ask. You have to know exactly what you're asking for. So, and the thing is, it's, it's not difficult. There are a thousand places on YouTube that will teach you how to do that. Um, and you just have to keep practicing and keep practicing and keep practicing. Um, so yeah. You get the funds that you ask for. And if you never ask, you'll never get the fund. You'll get, you'll get turned down a thousand times, but the thousand and one time will be the time that you, that you get the funding. So you just have to keep asking. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you so much for your time. And also for Quotes Women. It's a very important platform, um, not only in South Africa, but in the continent as well. And thank you so much for taking the time to actually work on it. Thank, thank you. you. Um, next up, we have our Accelerator Program Manager, Philip Mohodu. Morning, everyone. Um, sorry about that. I got cut off earlier because of load shedding. And yeah, so this is a bit delayed now. I was gonna thank you for actually joining the webinar, but since we are already, already in it, I'm just gonna take you through just a very quick overview of why we are here and why we are doing what we do. So Jam Lab, to those who don't know, it's actually short for Journalism and Media Lab. What we aim to do is to promote innovation within the continent. And I'm privileged to say we are the biggest, if not one of the largest digital media innovation hubs in Africa. And what we aim to do through this webinars is to actually bring along alumni from different cohorts because we have been around since 2017 for them to not only interact, meet, but also cross-pollination of ideas uh, in terms of their journey. Some they're still working on their startups, some they've actually pivoted into other startups, some are working on totally different projects. But also in addition to that, creating linkages between not just Jam Lab cohorts, but also with other external stakeholders. This could be entities from the private or the public sector. 
So what we have realized over the years through working with different entrepreneurs, fellows, and organizations across the continent is there are so many challenges within the digital media. And Kathy did touch on some of them related to investments and also funding as well and bootstrapping, which is very, very, it's such a very complex phenomena. And those issues are even more compounded when you go to other countries, which may be less developed than South Africa. And what we are seeing is the media landscape is changing, but not only in Africa, but globally. And we are actually very privileged to be part of that solution through the JAMLA program. And what we are also seeing is the journalism and media industry has faced many challenges over the past few years. And it's encouraging to see media enterprises and entrepreneurs leading innovative ideas to bring together change in whatever form, capacity, tone, or texture. And another thing that we're also seeing within the media landscape is the digital communications are expanding opportunities to create new kinds and forms of media and engage audience in a totally different way. And journalists and media makers are also increasingly having to operate independently rather than just relying on long-term employment within large media enterprises or institutions. And this evolution is disrupting the labor markets, but at the same time, creating new pockets of opportunities for not only entrepreneurs, but also innovators and other stakeholders that are working within uh, the media industry or any other sector that's actually adjacent to it. And furthermore, what we are seeing is also globalization as well, intertwined with technological advancement, um, and also the shift in geopolitics between different jurisdictions and the changes in regulatory structures, and how that's also affecting and influencing the consumption, the production, the marketization, and the finalization of different media products and services. And all of these things I've said, they require new ways of new create new ways of being creative. They require people to set up enterprises or innovation centers or create media products and services to create new market outlets or tapping into those different opportunities. And we are actually at Jam Lab, we are very proud to be part of that, those changes, disruptions, and evolutions. And previously over the years, what we did was we focused primarily on the alumni, on, on the accelerator program. And what we are realizing is post the program, some of the fellows, they find themselves sort of lingering around and not really knowing where to go because it's like you offer someone support for six months from there, they're sort of booted out into the real world, which doesn't really create any form of sustainable change. And we are hoping this webinars and also other initiatives that we are currently working on to offer the alumni more support but also other stakeholders that actually may be working within the digital media or adjacent industries in terms of cross-pollination of ideas or ways in which we can actually help these entities to become more sustainable. So yeah, thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you also for being part of this journey. So yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Philip, for that. Um, I have a question for you. Um, how does the program support upcoming startups and entrepreneurs? Okay, that was a blind side. <laughs> you should have told me that before. Um, so what we do through the accelerator program is it's a six to seven months program. The fellows, they come in either with their startup at different stages. It could be an idea, it could be an existing enterprise, or they could sometimes they just have just a product or a service and we try to help them develop business models around that. But also most importantly, now we're also focusing on helping them create commercial models around that, which is very, very critical. And this also taps into what Kathy spoke about when it comes to fundraising. It's one thing for you to have a great product or service, but if it's not commercially viable or packaged in a certain way or articulated commercially in a certain way, it's very difficult to get funding especially in situations we can't always rely on, on fellowships, which are super competitive, very, very, very competitive. Um, sometimes, as Kathy did mention, one needs to tap into different avenues to, to raise funds. So that's what we, we are building. We're building capacity to help the different entrepreneurs to actually be able to, to do that. Yeah. So what we do is we offer our mentorship, coaching. There's the theoretical part, but there's also the practical part. And 
it's it's just very weird that we're working with startups, but also we consider ourselves a startup as well. And there have been moments when we are bootstrapping, whereby the resource is pretty much limited because I'm the one who's usually running the program, while Linda Kuke is running the entire Jamla program, which has the newsletter and coordinating also all other different um, projects. So we are also right now looking into getting more capacity to support the entrepreneurs, the fellows, but also the alumni as well. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much Fido, for that. Um, next on the virtual stage, we have Siabonga Mkolo. Siabonga is the founder of Pocket Studio, which is a freelance marketplace that matches brands and production companies to African content creators. This platform started off as an idea that aimed to place film school graduates into various roles within the audiovisual industry by vetting and matching them with production companies working across platforms such as film, television, animation, as well as online content. So Siabonga has started another company called Grapefruit. He will tell us about it shortly. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much for that. How's it everyone? It's so great to see some familiar names and some uh, new names uh, in this webinar. Um, but yeah, uh, just give me a second. I'm actually trying to share my screen as well so that uh, I can just kind of run through this in a, in a logical order. Uh, so just give me a second. Oh, there we go. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. Sorry, I'm not, oh, okay, cool, perfect. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So, um, oh, just a bit disclaimer, there are going to be videos in these presentations, but there's no sound. I just put them there just so everyone has a sense of the kind of work that we've been doing and what we're trying to push. So, yeah, so, Kathy mentioned, I just realized that, you know, in the process of putting this document together, this is actually my 10th year in the audiovisual industry. And essentially we've been working across different formats. So I started with a digital company called Otre in 2015. And we've been shooting music videos, uh, short films, uh, corporate videos for a number of brands. And um, with that experience, you know, I've been able to develop more than 80 screen credits to my name. I've been able more than 187 jobs for various freelancers, or like editors, cinematographers, just working on different uh, projects. And what had happened, you know, from 2015 towards 2018 was that the, the work was getting so much that I wasn't really able to. To, to, to handle the, the, the request from various clients. And so we were trying to find a way just to make it easier for us to find these creatives on demand and also find a way to manage our organization because files would get lost or things would be mislabeled or this person not available at a certain time. And it was very difficult because then we're like, okay, how do we do this? Do we have WhatsApp as a database? Do we use Google Drive to store the content? And different projects require different tools. And in all of that, that's when we're like, you know, we've got to do this for ourselves. Uh, because currently I'm still actually going to the same problem where with storage specifically, I'm actually spending about 460 rand per month uh, for 430 gigs, you know, uh, and it has just become really unsustainable. So 2015, O3 started, and then from 2018, that's when we came about with Pocket Studio. And Pocket Studio essentially aimed to answer all those problems, you know, from being able to find creatives and as the, the, as, as, as the, the buyer kind of alluded to, we just wanted to democratize the industry and make it more accessible because we were working with clients that are just looking for different gigs and we just couldn't take it on ourselves. So we just wanted this to be another vehicle through which brands can connect the creatives that we're working with. And so around 2020, that's when we started to get a little bit of traction. We started pitching, started attending various conferences. And I think it was in 2021 where I actually applied, or 20, end of 2020, beginning of 2021, where I applied to Jamlab. And it really was a process of having a really sound springboard to throw a lot of uh, thoughts against, you know, chatting with Philip a lot of the times. It really helped to have these ideas shared with someone who had a very objective lens and allowed us to validate key assumptions, you know, whilst going through the, the, the program. And so as Philip mentioned, you know, the, the program was about six months or so. And then I think maybe this is maybe the core of my story where it's like between 2021 and 2023, everything that for me, yeah. um, maybe, maybe to break it down on three levels, you know, on a professional level,
Sorry, say you're breaking. We can't really hear you. The audio. Can you hear me now? Is that a little bit yes, better? We can hear you very well. We can hear you very well. Okay, sorry. So what I was trying to say was that, you know, between 20 and 2020 and 2023, that's when everything went wrong and everything went right. And on the first level, uh, the first struggle was actually trying to find a way to manage our production responsibilities whilst building this app. And I think the problem with the app and on one level were the team dynamics. Everyone was trying to pull in their own directions. Some people like this feature more. And it just became this very contentious space where we're burning money and not coming up with like final decisions. And it really just became this process where every day it will became a chore. And um, on top of that, you know, COVID and it's trying to survive. So it's like, if someone has a gig, we work on this app part-time. So if someone has a job, they kind of need to do that job so that they can bring back uh, bread at home or whatever. And it's like, we can't really force them to do something that's not being paid for essentially. And I think, you know, besides that as well, you know, there were a lot of family challenges that I was experiencing and I think not to get too emotional about it, you know. Uh, during 2021, my grandmother passed away. Uh, my co-founder's mother passed away. And, you know, I was actually engaged to be married as well. So it's like the pressures of trying to get married and all of that. And I think, I, yeah, so not, I think I actually had a, a mental breakdown towards the end of that year with all that pressure. And I think that breakdown was a blessing and a curse in, in so many different ways because so many relationships were kind of put on ice. But with what was put on ice, I was able to really think about what I, what I wanted to do with this idea and with, with this app. And it became this process of redefining and relearning. It was so exciting. I finally really got to the point of saying, okay, no, let's, let's take this and let's call it grapefruit and we'll, we'll make it work. We know what didn't work before. We'll, we'll, we'll focus on what, what we really need. And then we're able to really scale down what we want this version of this app to be, which essentially is file storage and collaboration, version control and digital portfolios. So essentially we're not trying to be a marketplace as yet because it's still that chicken and egg situation that needs to be solved with marketplaces. So we figured let's maybe jump a step before we get to marketplaces. Let's deal with production companies who kind of have a, a crew that they'd like to work with, but it's just managing media, managing files. And also for the creatives, it's like how, how's about the users or for, or for them rather, how's about this becomes a way for them to advertise their skills and their services. So with that revision or that pivot in mind, we, we are tapping back into our old networks, you know, so I was, one of my clients was the Hive uh, Network Johannesburg from 2018 to about 2020. And we, we really provided our, our audio visual services to them in profile and some of the entrepreneurs. So a lot of the relationships that we had then are still quite strong right now. Um, so a lot of these brands like Engine, Pick and Pay, Sun International, Glencore, all of these opportunities came about with uh, collaborations with uh, Hive members. And I think this also really speaks to Philip's point about being tapping into that alumni network because I would not have been able to sustain myself had these projects not come about and these projects have been a testament to like, okay, so even without the hype, because the hype did close down unfortunately because of COVID, disrupting the business model. So even with that context, we're still able to push and uh, and what we, re what we also want to do is, you know, also leverage their social media channels uh, uh, because the WhatsApp group has about 50 member businesses, but on the social media channels, we've got almost 5,000 followers and we think that might allow us to really spread the message of what we're trying to do and maybe appeal to people who may be interested in the service that we're pro providing. And I think with this video specifically, what I want to highlight is the kinds of businesses that are in the WhatsApp group. So with JNB sponsoring the Hive, uh, we had businesses in fashion, in, in multimedia, in animation, in eventing. So there are various touch points where they still need audiovisual services as they did need them before. And I think now it's just, it's just gonna come with that context that says we've worked before, let's try this out. And I think we'll be able to test and refine as we go along. So yeah, so essentially that's kind of where we're at right now. So for the past year, I spoke about doing research. Uh, we've got a research document that we were doing with, uh, with, uh, in partnership with the British Council. And essentially it's looking at the audiovisual industry, looking at the size of it, looking at all the challenges that are there. And yeah, so this is a very deep document for us because it kind of lays a foundation for us to base all our decisions on going forward. And also this time around with the second image, uh, this is our brand guideline essentially. And we, we try to have a little bit more fun this time around because we also felt that Pocket Studio was just a little bit too stiff. It didn't speak to our sensibilities or the creative 
Your audio is breaking a bit. The pocket video situation. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Well, look, I'm at the end of the presentation. Okay, no problem. Uh, I'm at the end of the pres presentation, essentially. So these last two slides is essentially the work that we're doing in terms of our social media, where we want to launch, launch podcasts, where we interview various stakeholders, and we want to have like a, a, an insights-driven marketing approach where it's more of a dialogue than it is saying like, hey, this is what uh, Grapefruit does, or hey, this is what you can do with Grapefruit. But it's like, let's have the dialogues that our research has kind of found that these are conversations that are happening in silos, but let's bring it out into the broader kind of discourse or the broader kind of environment. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's, that's where we're at right now. And I think just to maybe leave some parting thoughts, uh, the one biggest lesson that I learned was to try and find ways to love myself and love my customers, you know, because I think sometimes as entrepreneurs, we're not as kind to ourselves. We always try to be ambitious, but we don't feel able to take care of ourselves. And I realized that you can't hope to serve your customers in a state where you haven't taken care of yourself. So that's very important. And I watched a video last week from Y Combinator where they were speaking about how Loving your customers is actually your secret weapon. It's a unique advantage that a lot of companies aren't, aren't grasping. Really, you know, it's like you want to see the passion from the founders. You want to see why they love their, their customers and why they want to serve them because it is a service. I mean, and as much as we may make unicorn billion dollar companies, it's like, do you love your customers? You know, so I think so far those have been like the biggest key lessons that I've taken from this entire experience. So yeah, so that's that's it, pretty much it about me. And I uh, hope you guys uh, enjoyed that. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank you so much, Siabonga, for that. And a very impressive, um, extensive uh, CV, 10 years experience in the game, um, and also <laughs> creating employment. It's really impressive, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions mm. uh, before I open questions to the floor. Wanted to know um, what makes South Africa an ideal geography um, to launch and run your business? Oh man, uh, so many things, man. We have a, we actually have the oldest, I think, audiovisual industry globally. Um, I'm not sure what the date is, but we, we have the oldest industry and the people who are really in charge of it at the time were a lot of military people. So the early days of the industry was like, very military, you know, Tango, one, two, fast track, whatever, you know, very like efficient. And I think, you know, given the dynamics of our social political landscapes, a lot of policies were introduced uh, with the democracy and whatnot. And I think we're still trying to find our feet, but it doesn't take away from our rich history as, as, as content or storytellers, essentially. And I think now there's been such an active push to prioritize the creative industries as a critical sector for the economy, that the support from government is there the people who are looking to really build something that's aimed at really enhancing the creative industry. So I think as a geography, those are like kind of the main two points. And also internationally, we have one of the best rebate kind of programs for like companies from the UK or Canada or wherever, where if they shoot here, they get some portion of this, uh, the monetary spend back. So that makes it great. We have great crews that come at very cost-effective rates as compared to like Hollywood or, the, or other industries. So yeah, like, Right now, I've got streaming services coming through, Disney Plus, Netflix, all of these things. So it's like right now is really the moment to tap into the power of creative industries. I think because I'm in the audiovisual sector, that's what makes more sense to me. But yeah, it's a great time and a great geography for, for these kinds of innovations. Are you looking to um, expand to other countries? 100%. Um, we do want to scale across Africa. Definitely, um, there are just some le uh, legal things that we just need to navigate, especially when it comes to like poppy and whatnot. Um, but definitely the, 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 the intention is to build that. And once you kind of get through those uh, regulatory uh, hurdles, you definitely wanna tap into this network and make people from the alumni here some value in it. You know, it's like, yo, if you wanna work, if you find value in this, uh, I'm very happy to, to collaborate. In fact, I'll post my email address in the chat as well, okay. just for anyone who wants to reach out. Okay, thank you. Uh, you've described a very, uh, very challenging year, and my sincere condolences mm -hmm. to you and your friends. 
Um, and you've oh, have you and you've also spoken uh, openly about mental health and the challenges. So please, can you tell me what advice would you give to entrepreneurs who are struggling with the mental um, health? Hmm. <laughs> um, first and foremost, professional help is 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 very important. Um, I think more than just lying on yourself and your immediate surroundings, if you can get to a space and look, cost bear is also a thing, right? But if you can get to a space, you can get professional help. That's always like a great port of call, especially in, in, in terms of crisis. Um, and also in, in our industry, uh, there are a couple of movements where people are starting to create toolboxes for mental health. Uh, there are support lines available for people who are dealing with mental health. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's important to try find a sense of harmony in the work that you do and the life that you live. And I think it helps to find something that aligns with your actual personal uh, sensibilities. You know, I love being in the film industry. I just hate the systems, you know, and this is why we built this app because I still want to be a filmmaker after this. And I want to use this app to make films. But, you know, the, the long hours, the unfair pay, those, those things also contribute you know, to feelings of uh, depression and anxiety because you don't know when you'll be able to afford the next meal. Meals, sorry, the next meal. Sorry. So I think try find any professional help that you can. Try invest uh, as much as you can in a healthy diet because the diet is also important. Try find hobbies that actually take you outside of work. You know, even if it's walking at the park on a Sunday morning, just have a routine that takes you outside of work and allows you to reconnect. Because sometimes we find that these crises always come about when there's like this deep disconnect between what you think you're doing, how you're achieving, and it all becomes quite explosive when it becomes a breakdown. But ideally, uh, those channels do help. Or tend to, they've helped in my context, and I can't really say that this is going to help or work for everyone, but that's kind of what I'd say. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, what has been um, the biggest milestone so far since you started your entrepreneurial journey? Ooh, biggest milestone. Two, oh, maybe the one milestone is this report, you know, because in, in this report, the, the angle that I was taking and writing it was really interrogating the mental health crisis in the film industry. And I think part of my recovery was being able to articulate what the actual challenges are, but also being able to validate that actually I'm not the only one, you know. So it was a great milestone because it was done with the support of the British Council. And when they read it, they were like, you know, if you like it, let's see if you can take it further. So I think for me, that's the biggest milestone because I think I've been pitching Parker Studio or Grapefruit for a good, I think, six years now. And it's very hard to, you know, stay motivated, you know. But I think with that report, it's what it says to me is that it doesn't need to be called Parker Studio, it doesn't need to be called Grapefruit. Essentially, these are the problems and we just need to solve them. Let's, let's just act on that. So, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest milestone for me. Okay. Given your experience with both uh, Pocket Studio and Grapefruit, um, what would you consider the biggest driver in a business model? Uh, I guess it comes down to creating and capturing value, you know, and understanding what value is. Value could be you being able to pick your crew up in the morning instead of them having to be there, right? But you know that they're going to give you the best six hours that they can for that day or 12 hours that they can for that day. So I think it comes down to that, create, uh, being able to create and capture that value. And this is where the business models become important. Um, and it's, 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 it's really finding business models that make sense to the context. You know, not everything needs to be a subscription. Not everything needs to be a commission or whatever, but it's like find what makes sense in terms of that value. Because once you get to that point, it becomes very easy for you to engage with your customers because they are always key. In fact, with the Y Combinator video I was watching, all that I mentioned in terms of loving your customers, a, a lot of the sentiments that a lot of businesses are trying to serve VC targets. So a, a lot of the businesses are designed to speak to speak the VC language, but they, they don't quite touch that love factor for the customers. So I think that's where creating capturing value also comes in. It's like love your customers, love the business, and also understand what VCs and, and, the, and that stakeholder ecosystem requires and just mm -hmm. finding a balance in between all of those things. Um, talking about loving your customers, how does one actually bring their fullest and purest self to building a business? 
Uh, it's an, it's, it starts inside, hey? At least for me, it started with realizing that I actually love this industry, you know? And the people or my customers, right? Are actually my peers. So it's like, there are certain decisions that may not necessarily translate from a, a monetary point of view, right? But if we're talking about love, it's like, if we are a, a unicorn, right? But it only costs us 10 million to operate, right? And our customers are still not sure when they're going to get paid. You know, you have to have that empathy to be like, okay, we don't need this money, right? Let's actually help these customers. How can we reinvest back into the infrastructure? You know, so it's, it's really just having that keen on the ground perspective that allows you to really tap in. But I think it starts with knowing who you are and what you love first before you can actually do that for your customers. Thank you so much for that, Siabonga. And all the best for grapefruit thank you thank you very much thank you um have any questions uh from the floor okay um so we have our webinar oh we have a question from philip um, it's actually not a question. It's more of a, a comment. And just to, maybe in addition to before we actually close is um, we're currently in the process of trying to figure out how we can actually support and grow the alumni group, but also any other players with the digital media or outside that. And I think it will be great rather than just creating something and letting, letting it sort of infiltrate all the way down or cascade down. If any alumni has any ideas in terms of how we can better support the ecosystem or contribute to the ecosystem in the most positive and sustainable way, it would be really, really good to sort of have a chat or just drop an email or a call. I've changed my number. So yeah, I think it would be great to, to sort of do that because um, just going back to the two presentations and thank you very much, uh, Kathy and Sia and also see uh, on just being a little bit more human okay because i think sometimes we tend to focus so much on the physics of building things and life keeps on going you just want to achieve things and milestones and value propositions very 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 big words but um life is also even more crucial than that and sometimes you forget to find ways of actually humanizing the work that we do and also how we show up it's like you always have to be professional or sound in a certain way so that it can be taken more seriously uh so um thank you very much for that um it's sort of it's 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 grounding me in a way but also in itself it's also giving me ideas in terms of how do we build the alumni i don't know the ecosystem of the group in a way that's actually more humane in a way that's actually very authentic as well i mean we've seen these alumni groups that exist everything is just yeah post something it ends up being very transactional. And the issue with transactions is mostly, most of them are not really sustainable. And also that's what we are hoping to do at JamLab. And hopefully we'll have more resources to make things a little bit more humane. So yeah, see, so yeah, I thank you very much for that. We'll touch very soon, yeah? No, for sure. Thanks for the kind words. Yes, man, yeah. let's take this forward. And also for Kathy as well, a uh, really inspiring story, getting the Google grant. I know how competitive it is. I don't know how you did it, uh, maybe you need to give us a master class on that, Kathy. So I'm just sort of throwing in a challenge. <laughs> Plus the uh, the applications to those people who want to apply, the applications are currently open. So yeah, as in people should look into that. It's a really good grant. And also there are other opportunities as well. So we want to try to find ways of creating a platform where we can share all these different opportunities. Uh, we do already do that on the on the Jam Lab, on the Jam Lab group. But we want to create something a little bit more open where everyone can access the different opportunities and who to talk to, who's working on what. Anyway, I'm rambling now, so I'm just going to exit. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming through. Thank you. Thanks uh, for that. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So we have come to the end of our informative webinar. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for making time to join us. Please feel free, like Philip said, to just drop ideas on how we can actually include uh, um, ideas on how we can include and make the Jam Lab Accelerator Alumni Program more accessible. And we can 
um, get everyone to be in touch with each other. Um, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the support of our funders and partners, the Swedish International Development Agency CEDA through the CHARM project for their generous support, the Open Society Foundation Program on Independent Journalism, and the VET University Center for Journalism. Please continue to keep in touch with and engage with us on social media or drop us an email at info at Thank you so much.